So my voice is not that great if you can't hear this shout from the back. Yeah? So what I'm going to do today is, uh, is really a work in progress, uh, uh, what we are trying to do to understand uh, the mechanical aspects of the nucleus and how this mechanical aspect of the nucleus has enormous control on genome regulation that all of you think about. Mm. One of the reason why we got interested in this uh, is that if you look in your body different cell types, uh, each one of the cell type adapts to the local mechanical rigidity that exists. As you know your bones are much more stiffer, your neurons are the brain tissue is very soft, the muscles are somewhere in between. So cells adapt to the mechanical, local mechanical tension that exists in the tissue, not only adapt, they sculpt it through cellular differentiation. So such a sculpting of mechanical architecture of cells uh, has increasingly been found as a critical regulator of differentiation and reprogramming processes. Uh, not to bore you with these numbers, each one of a tissue has very different stiffness and so cells during differentiation have to adapt to those sti stiffness. And what has become clear is that as cells trans differentiate into many diseases, the cellular stiffness changes and adapts to that uh, new, uh, new micro environment that is very critical for regulating genes. So one of the places where we got interested in this is that if you looked at cells in the micro environment in a tissue, uh, cells actually have to acquire two different signals. One is the soluble chemical signals uh, that are sensed by the cells but also cells sense this mechanical, local mechanical architecture. Uh, these are drawings from Kahal almost more than a century ago, but our own understanding of how these things are sensed at the local cellular level in tissues are very poor. So based on the local micro environment signals, which is either matrix around which the cells sit or a combination of soluble signals, the nucleus has to be remodeled and genomes have to be remodeled in terms of regulatory aspects said that these cells then uh, go through this epigenetic landscape either for differentiation or for trans differentiation or for example cells of the uh, lymphocytes after activation for the death pathways uh, it's become very clear that the local micro environment signals are, are essential. So in thinking about nuclear mechanics uh, in a cellular context, uh, what one then has to really integrate is that cells are really mechanical architectures, so there is a physical entity, but also uh, cells perceive a number of biochemical signals which is highly multidimensional and complex biochemical circuits. So we have been asking the question that how do cells which are mechanical architecture integrate with this biochemical uh, signaling processes. Perhaps there are modular cores that connect these two spaces of cells and perhaps the way you organize genomes in the nucleus might be central to thinking about how cells perceive extracellular cues to integrate signaling uh, inputs to differentially turn on uh, expression programs. And so when you think of packing the DNA as all of you know is a really long uh, thread needs to be packed in a very small nuclear space so it is a mechanical problem. And there is a number of physical chemical constraints that go into organizing the DNA, uh, a number of histone and non-histone proteins that pack this DNA and I will elude at some of these things. And of course you need to keep it in a very spatial temporal dimension in living cells so that you can actually bring about transcriptional control and understanding this will have huge implications on our own thinking about reprogramming our cells. So in packing DNA in the nucleus in the last 10-15 years we know a lot about the, the organization of nuclear architecture. Uh, so work from a number of labs including Kramer's lab uh, has developed techniques of karyotyping. Uh, or developing very precise chromosome paints 
uh, said that when you paint the chromosomes in the nucleus, you find that the chromosomes are non-randomly arranged. In fact, we still do not understand how this non-random arrangement comes for chromosomes in a tissue specific manner, because we only have about 200 cell types in the body. And the, and the growing understanding is that these 200 cell types in different tissues might have a very distinct organization of chromosomes, uh, spatial organization of the chromosomes. And such chromosome arrangements in recent years through a variety of molecular biology techniques including chromosome conformation capture as well as sequencing methodologies has introduced us to a new dimension of really a spatial compartmentalization of transcriptional control. And so, I will allude at how cell mechanics uh, perhaps are actually intersecting uh, very precisely with this genome architecture in being able to bring together uh, very precise regulatory processes. And so, when you think of intersecting with genomes, uh, as I said cells these are typical fibroblasts. Uh, and uh, green is a nucleus labeled histones are labeled in EGFP. Uh, cells have to sense the extracellular matrix and there is a number of mechanosensing proteins on the cell membranes including integrins that cells sense and these signals then have to be transduced to the scale of individual genes or groups of genes. Uh, and in recent years including the institute that we have set up which really leads the understanding of how these sensor signals are actually transduced to remodel cytoskeleton, transduced to remodel the genomes both in cell culture conditions and in developing organisms. And eventually these signals that are sensed at the cell surface uh, have to integrate with chromatin remodeling enzymes and a number of post translational modification uh, that precise gene expression is brought about. So, the question that uh, comes about is that in all of this because as I said in the beginning cells are really mechanical in architecture in our tissues. How does the geometry of cells uh, impact on the mechanics of the nucleus and the nuclear organization uh, and I am going to show you that perhaps there are very intriguing mechanical codes uh, for regulating our genomes. Uh, and I will summarize we think that this has huge implications on our understanding of genome integrity, genomic processes, uh, host pathogen interactions and so on and so forth. So, one way to think about doing this uh, controlling cell geometry is to go to tissues uh, and uh, directly work with cells from tissues which are very differing geometries. But we took a step back so that we can actually have a controlled and in a quantifiable manner we can think about the impact of cell geometry on nucleus is to take advantage of a number of microfabrication technologies that are out in the field. Uh, so, uh, this is a printing technique uh, and I will elaborate on this quite a bit later because this is going to be very important for many of the diagnostic tools that one would like to make. Uh, this is originally introduced by Michelle Burns and others in Curie. Uh, the technique is very simple. Uh, when you plate your cells in culture, they take random shapes, but the same cells in the body, they are very precise shapes. So, any diagnostic or any sensing mechanisms has to involve controlling cell geometry. So, what we decided to do was to take connective tissue cells, uh, which are the fibroblasts which build up pretty much a large portion of a cell mass in the body and try to pattern them into different shapes. Uh, so, these are using you can use any ligand of your interest is a stamp that you make using a microfabrication technology. You dip this stamp uh, in your ligand solution and print it on your tissue culture dish. What that lets you do is to take these cells and change its geometry very precisely, because the these patches are now containing the ligand. Uh, in this case we use fibronectin which is a ligand for integrin signaling and these cells are really polarized and typically when they are attached to substrate they take about uh, 1400 micrometer squared in dimension. So, we can now tune the shape of the cell either in its aspect ratio or the shape or the size of the cell and ask how does the genome respond to it. 
if we understand the rules that govern how the genomes are regulated, we can take this back to tissues. Uh, we can take this back to pathology uh, and try and understand how genomes then respond uh, in, in these various uh, environments. So, uh, when you change the shape of the cell, there's a number of interesting things happen because changes in shape changes the mechanical tension that's built up in the cell. Here is the same fibroblast cell which is very polarized. The green color is the actin stress fibers and the blue color is the nucleus. These cells in the body uh, really have this actin uh, compressing the nucleus into a very flat shape. Uh, this is what you will see in your tissue samples that the nucleus is actually squeezed between these actin layers in this polarized uh, cell. There is a, there's a bottom actin and the top actin squeezing the nucleus in this form and that is the natural state in the tissue. Now, if you change the shape of the cell as you see here, these are different patterns uh, going from a very polarized state to a very symmetric state. What you do is remodel the actin in a very precise manner. The actin that was in stress fiber form now comes to become a very punctated structure as you find here and as a consequence the nucleus bulges out. The nucleus which is held stably, uh, now the nucleus becomes highly uh, elongated in the z axis. And now you can already imagine which I am going to show you in the later slides that the genome that is compacted there, the chromosome that are compacted there responds to these changes. Uh, elaborately, uh, so that regulatory mechanisms are set up in a very modular manner uh, in these <coughs> cells. So, one of the major consequences of changing the geometry of cells is that the same cell when you change the geometry to a circular pattern as you see here the actin organization has changed, but there is an intrinsic instability that is set up in the in all of our cells that the nucleus invariably starts to rotate with a loss of control from the cytoskeletal structures. So, this is critical because if the nucleus starts to rotate, uh, you can already think of signaling processes that are going to change and these instabilities are important in the tissue homeostatic regime. So, the reason that the nucleus takes the spin is that the actin cytoskeleton now which is stably held in a, in a connective tissue cell undergoes this enormous convective flows uh, intrinsically, thus the live cell movie of how the actin, uh, actin flows are set up. And these actin flows are set up primarily by myosin motors, which are actually contracting this actin flows. So, that if you add inhibitors to myosin motors, you only have retrograde flow of the actin, but no contractile flows, uh, such that the nuclear instability is a loss. So, cells balance the nucleus with a very subtle coupling to actomyosin contractility as you find here and that seems to be very important in these cells. The other thing that happens to cells when you change the geometry is that the nucleus which was highly stable uh, becomes highly plastic when you depolymerize actin or change the geometry of cells uh, suggesting that geometric control of chromatin plasticity is set up via this actomyosin contractility. Uh, in the same cell what you have done is depolymerize actin using a number of inhibitors, you can see that the nucleus becomes highly plastic. And if you looked at stem cells either in the organism or in culture, stem cells exhibit the same plasticity uh, uh, in, the, in terms of chromatin plasticity. So, here is a typical time trace of the same nucleus, the nucleus which is very stable in a somatic cell or this connective tissue cell and it goes as enormous oscillations of plastic state and inhibiting myosin motors stabilizes this. So, we are now identified a very important link connecting actin, myosin and formins. Formins are the nucleators of actin polymerization. There are the small structures of uh, actomyosin formin that drives the nuclear plasticity when the cell geometry constraints change uh, and one of the major things that happens is that the lamins which are the nuclear architectural proteins are down regulated uh, as cell geometry constraints change as well as the microtubules reorganize and I will not have time to go through that. 
in a nutshell what all of this means is that the nuclear stiffness uh, can be controlled very tightly by cell geometry as many of you know the nucleus is very soft in a stem cell and starts to stiffen as differentiation program sets in and so here one has taken a terminally differentiated cell and you can now tune the stiffness or cells appear to tune the stiffness of the nucleus based on the geometric constraints they take in the tissue. Uh, so, this is intriguing because if the cell geometry is so critical then perhaps permissiveness to chromatin then uh, becomes uh, quite, uh, quite uh, elaborate uh, in this context. So, what I am showing you here uh, is in the nucleus for example by staining using hex in these uh, fibroblast cells you can already see heterochromatin structures. If you make a time chymographs of this heterochromatin structure they are highly stable when the geometry of the cell is stabilized. But if you depolymerize actin these heterochromatin nodes starts to become highly dynamic or if you change the geometry of these cells uh, the heterochromatin structures become highly dynamic and if you inhibit myosin motors they get stabilized. So, these are typical x y trajectories of how individual parts of the genome or individual parts of the chromosomes are moving around in the nucleus based on geometric constraints. So, when the geometry is stabilized they are actually stable and when the geometry is uh, re relaxed when the cell matrix constraints are relaxed uh, these individual parts of the chromatin starts to move around. So, we have an elaborate program which I do not have time to talk about today is to think about how heterochromatin and telomeres uh, are very sensitive to matrix constraints. Uh, the bottom line is that if you build a simple correlation matrix basically it is telling you if one part of the genome is moving around is the other part of the genome moves around with you when the cell geometric constraints are stabilized they all move together within the nucleus, but when the cell matrix constraints are reduced they are completely decorrelated uh, suggesting that there is a dynamic fingerprint of how you organize chromatin architecture within the nucleus the stabilized by cell mechanics uh, constraints. So, based on this we have pushed uh, imaging techniques uh, this is a fluorescence polarization imaging technique to directly visualize chromatin compaction states in living cells. Uh, so, that you can bypass the antibody staining uh, uh, techniques. So, what you find is that using such techniques I am happy to talk about this technique later. You find that when the in terminally differentiated cells there is a very elaborate chromatin compaction pattern uh, the setup parts of the chromatin is uh, highly condensed and parts are uh, loosely condensed, but as the matrix constraints change you completely open out chromatin compaction states and uh, these are typical plots of uh, spatial correlation uh, methods uh, which is primarily telling you that if one part of the chromatin is compacted what is the length square over which this compaction states are coupled in the in the cell nucleus and what you find is that as the matrix constraints reduce you have a broad length scale in the way chromatin gets compacted as well as you introduce a population heterogeneity is as though that in a terminally differentiated cell when the matrix is firmly uh, signaling to the cell the chromatin compaction states are all very uniform there is a homogeneous type of cell system that you will have in a tissue, but the moment cell matrix constraints are reduced you build up a population heterogeneity suggesting that they will now respond to different signals in a very different manner. So, based on this uh, we can now directly see which parts of the chromatin open up as the cell matrix constraints change and basically to cut a long story short these techniques now allow which part of the uh, gene regulatory sites can be exposed uh, and directly visualizing this temporal correlation. These are image correlation techniques to start from the uh, time lapse movies of this. Uh, single cell nuclear compaction states will give you if the cell matrix is stabilized the chromatin is stabilized but the chromatin remodels quite a bit uh, the moment the matrix constraints are reduced. So, all of this suggests that there must be a very elaborate molecular link 
stabilizing chromatin. So, we have an ongoing secondary RNA screen that uh, is trying to identify all the components that connect the actomyosin links to the chromatin through the nuclear envelope. And there are some very interesting molecules that when ablated genetically uh, results in decondensation of the chromatin structure. So, what you see here is a simple fluorescence recovery of the photo bleaching experiments where when the histones are tightly bound to the DNA, if you photo bleach parts of the chromatin then the histones do not exchange with each other because the histones are tightly bound. These are core histones, but when you ablate some of the actin related links, histones turn over rapidly suggesting that those local parts of the DNA are now gotten exposed and we now have a number of series of molecules starting from the place where the cells attach to the matrix uh, and from for example, tail and vinculin these are important components of the focalizations uh, that cells use to attach to the matrix. When ablated uh, you have complete alterations in the histone dynamics uh, between the histone DNA interactions. And more recently with, uh, uh, with Marco Fione at EFORM, we now find that such mechanical constraints in fact regulate the DNA repair proteins, how they exchange with the chromatin, how they relocalize to the nuclear envelope based on mechanical tension. I do not have time to talk about that today. So, in a nutshell what I have been trying to say is that the nuclear mechanical index uh, has to be in a very precise homeostatic balance. So, uh, every cells in our body has to have a force balance in packing a chromatin uh, into the nucleus. As all of you know because the chromatin is a very long polymer coil, uh, they are subjected to this entropic expansion left to itself. So, now we need to condense this chromatin fiber into an interface program into interface chromosome and during cell division as all of you know this gets condensed into a metaphase state. But this is a stable configuration that balances this outward and inward uh, condensation processes and these interface chromosomes are packed within the nucleus and the nucleus is actually held via this attachment size through an elaborate cytoskeletal architecture that I showed you. So, in all of us in all our cells the nucleus is actually held under a pre-stress tension it is like taking a rubber band and stretching it and keeping the rubber band in a stretch state and the nucleus is actually in that stretch state. And any relaxation of the matrix then relaxes this nucleus and introduce plasticity to the nucleus and permissivity to, to chromatin structure. Suggesting that these alterations in the cell mechanical uh, cues must have really precise uh, genetic outputs and which is what I am going to switch to to show you how genome regulatory processes change uh, based on this matrix constraints. And in addition we have just recently shown maybe uh, as recent as this month I think that cells keep an elaborate perinuclear actin as mechanosensing elements. Any small perturbations to mechanical tension introduces a new form of actin that coats the nucleus spontaneously and uh, I do not have time to talk about it, but happy to talk or after the after the seminar. So, uh, if these changes do have uh, important functional aspects, one of the things that we tried was to uh, link an input signal for cells which is a geometry for cells and an output signal which is a whole genome transcriptome. Uh, these are what we do is to sculpt cells into various geometries and in each of these geometries we take a whole genome microarray and now we are doing RNA seq. Uh, and what you see is a very nice pattern. This is the map heat map of the differentially regulated genes uh, as <coughs> shapes and sizes of the cells change. You see that uh, there is a map which suggests that different shapes are sens sensitive in a different way to transcriptional outputs. So, in the interest of time what I am going to do today is to take one example. Let us go from a very polarized cell to a very isotropic cell and analyze this genome the transcriptome to see are there modular rules that are set up uh, in this process. 
And one of the interesting things that we found was that when the cells are highly polarized, uh, cells turn on mostly the cell matrix genes uh, through the serum response pathway. And the same cell, th these are suggesting that the cells have to uh, attach to the matrix and the gene expression program is optimized to reinforce this attachment so that most of the matrix <coughs> genes are actually turned on. So when you change the shape of the cell into a highly isotropic shape, one would have thought that you would randomly change the, change the transcriptional program, but actually what you do is you switch the cellular transcriptional state into regulating mostly cell cycle genes in an NF kappa B dependent manner. That means that cells based on the shape of the nucleus and the matrix contact is really switching from one transcription program to the other transcription program in a very modular manner as you see here. That means that there must be rules governing how cells might be able to switch this because uh, since they are not actually randomly switching these processes. And one of the places to look for is to check if this is indeed via these specific pathways that cells use. So one way to test it is to go back and do single cell mechanical measurements uh, because the transcription cofactors for this pathway are identified well. MOL is a transcription cofactor for serum response pathway. This is identified in Richard Treisman's lab some years ago. And so you can label the transcription factor with the fluorescent tag and usually the cytosolic. Now we can take a single cell, attach them to the matrix, but coat the cell with magnetic particles on the plasma membrane and stretch the cell laterally <coughs> using this electromagnet. And if our hypothesis is right, what this process should do is to take this transcription factor, cofactor this in the cytoplasm uh, to the nucleus. And what you will find is that when I play this movie, if it plays, it plays. So this transcription factor really shuttle to the nucleus upon, upon the stretching of the cell. So cells sense this mechanical cues, activate this transcription factor that then actually goes to the nucleus. So we have now worked out a, a tight coupling that exists between mechanical signals and how transcription cofactors are shuttled to the nucleus. And one way that this, this pathway works is that these transcription cofactors are held by G actin, they are complex with G actin in the cytoplasm. But when you apply mechanical tension to cells, cells favor a more F actin <coughs> state. Uh, the F actin is polymerized more because of mechanical tension. And to polymerize more uh, F actin, what you need is more G actin. So the G actin to mol dissociates because the same G actin pool is used to make more F actin. And that's a way that this mol gets released to the nucleus to turn on downstream targets. So it's a very uh, interesting pathway that is kept. And now one is beginning to find for many transcription factors, including uh, YAP TAS has been found very nicely in Stefano Piccolo's lab in, uh, in, in Italy, uh, that there's a mechanical link to many, many of the transcription factors. We are now sorting a sorting a large number of transcription factor, how they are sensitive to mechanical cues. So based on this, one can go back and ask, is there a map in the nucleus for these transcription factors? Let me walk you through this slide a bit. As all of you know, genes are tightly controlled by a number of transcription factors. Uh, these transcription factors have their own target genes within the nucleus. And these target genes are harbored in various chromosomes uh, within the nucleus. So we decided to construct a map. Uh, if you had a whole genome transcriptome, what you can actually ask is there are about 87 transcription factors that are annotated in the world today. We took all the 87 transcription factors and in a given cell type like the connective tissue cells that we look at, we can then ask which of the target genes are active in the given chromosome in that cell type. And what you can then construct is a heat map of which chromosomes are active in, in the sense that when I say active, which chromosomes are producing more RNA because that is a readout and in each of these pathways. So this map will now tell us how when cell mechanics changes 
uh, what might be the changes that happens at the genomic level. And for that, we have to make a hypothesis and reanalyze the existing data in terms of the chromosome organization. As many of you know, chromosomes are non-randomly organized, and as I said before as well, we took this data that exists from Kramer's lab uh, and reanalyzed this data in a different way, which is to say that one could then ask uh, each chromosome has a location in XYZ location within the nucleus, and we could ask the distances between each chromosomes in terms of the centroid distances. So, this is a map of physical distances, it is an interchromosome physical distance, basically it tells you distances between each chromosome pairs. Just like how if I plot the distances between each one of you, it will be the mean distance of the chairs separating each one of us. When you do this, what you find is a certain chromosomes are uh, position within the nucleus with similar distances, whereas certain other chromosomes are, are at very differing distances. And surprisingly, when we took the transcriptome of the whole cell and then constructed the activity distances, which is basically which chromosomes are producing more RNA and which chromosomes are producing less RNA, what you found was that the chromosomes that are hanging out together within the nucleus are transcribing together within the nucleus. And the places where the chromosomes are positioned within the nucleus are the places where for a given cell type, all the transcription factor target genes are localized within that uh, spatial domain. So, this gives us an idea that there must be a genomic code uh, for thinking about cell mechanics integration to turn on uh, modular gene expression patterns. So, our current hypothesis is that there exists such a core and I will show you in the next few slides that there is a very nice elegant core that exists. Our idea was that uh, perhaps when cell geometric constraints change, what you change is uh, the nuclear morphology in a very precise way uh, in addition to nuclear plasticity. And each cells in our body, what we argue is there is a contact map, uh, a chromosome contact map said that the target genes. Uh, are co-clustered uh, of all the pathways in specific domains. And there has been very nice evidence in recent years, in the last three years particularly, uh, using chromosome cop capture and high C techniques. There is a number of genomic contacts one is beginning to find. Uh, what we argued was that perhaps there is a cell type specific contact and when mechanical cues are intersected with these cells where they change the cell geometry you go from one contact to the other contact, so that you can actually facilitate a new transcriptional program. Because as I said, when cells are polarized, they turn on a cell matrix genes uh, pretty much, which means that all the cell matrix genes must be co-clustered in this contact map. And when these cells change to very isotropic uh, cells that I showed you uh, previously, they turn on mostly cell cycle genes using an NF kappa B pathway. That means that a new contact is formed uh, within the nucleus. So, we can now test this very well. One way to do it is to take advantage of this chromosome painting techniques. We paint all possible pairs of chromosomes within the nucleus and compute and, and use high resolution imaging uh, to, to, to detect this intermingling fraction between chromosomes. Uh, we can quantify that intermingling fraction very well and you can plot it, uh, this intermingling fraction when you change geometry of cells. Uh, for example, when the cells are highly polarized, uh, in, this, uh, in this case chromosome 5 and 9 are intermingled more, whereas when the cells are less polarized, there are different chromosomes that intermingle more. So, our argument was that perhaps the target genes of different pathways must be in this intermingling fraction. So, we can actually show that in this intermingle fraction, you sequester most of the activated PAL2 because those are the sites of active transcription. So, we can show that indeed uh, in a geometric manner, the PAL2 enrichment uh, occurs at these intermingle fractions much more than other places. So, if what we are saying is true, 
then this intermingling fraction must harbor all the transcription cofactors and factors on PAL2 to be able to transcribe those target genes. Let me walk you through this slides a bit. Uh, when cells are polarized, uh, the serum response pathway cofactor is nuclear localized here. But when the same cells are isotropic, these transcription factors get out of the nucleus to the cytoplasm in a G actin, F, F to G actin dependent manner. But the opposite pathway, which is the NF kappa B pathway, the transcription factors are outside the nucleus when the cells are polarized. But as the cells are made isotropic in terms of geometric constraints, these transcription factors go to the nucleus. So, you have a nice compartmentalization of transcriptional uh, factors which go in and out of the nucleus in a cell mechanical, uh, cell <coughs> mechanics dependent manner. So, we argued then that these transcription factor then should come to uh, come and sequester in those intermingled regions that I showed you in the past slide. Uh, with the Paul 2 complexes and the other cofactors of the transcription. So, these are really super resolution imaging directly snapshots that we make within the nucleus of how the complex of the serum response pathway cofactor and the factor in the Paul 2 gets localized within those nanoscale domains uh, within the nucleus. And now, when the cell matrix constraints change, you switch from partners of this pathway to partners of the NF kappa B transcription factors with the PAL2 uh, in, the, in these regimes. So, which means the transcription factors that shuttle in and out are used very specifically by cell mechanical constraints to sequester into these intermingling domains uh, within the nucleus. So, which means that we should be able to push this technologies quite a bit and really look at what genes are existing. So, what we now have set up is a new method uh, to be able to open out the nucleus and ask can we directly catch uh, those gene clusters that that, it, that, that has to co-regulate uh, either the NF kappa B pathway or the serum response pathway or any other pathways that, uh, that uh, one is studying. So, gratifyingly what we find is that uh, I am happy to discuss the technique we spend quite a bit of time to optimize this technique uh, uh, is to in different cell matrix constraints, we can open out the nucleus and chop out uh, chromatin using the specific uh, restriction enzymes. And since we are cross linked before we open out the nucleus, we can now look at nanoscale the green color of the, of the DNA stains. Uh, this is at super resolution you will not see it in confocal microscopy. Uh, you can see genes that are co-clustered uh, with each other within the nucleus. And now, we make a map of this. And interestingly, when the cell matrix constraints are stabilized, these clusters are decorated with antibodies to serum response factor in the PAL2. But when the cell matrix constraints are altered, these clusters are now decorated with the P65 uh, antibodies, suggesting that those clusters harbor the transcription factors which are co-localized with them and we can pick them up. And now, we are developing a technique to really lift them off because we can then sequence them because the sequencing will directly tell us which groups of genes come close together of a given pathway in a mechanical, uh, mechanically dependent manner. And that will offer us uh, unusual, uh, this is a revised version of a high C technique because the high C technique is an ensemble averaging of a millions of cells. So, you obtain contact maps in the nucleus, but it is for a large st statistical averaging. What we have now is a very localized way to pick up a gene cluster within the nucleus, lift them off and sequence, so that we can actually get a very intriguing group of genes that actually come together far away. So, basically what this is what I wanted to try and touch base uh, that cells in a matrix dependent manner, we can now begin to push super resolution imaging with, uh, with uh, uh, you know capture techniques and sequencing techniques. So, that we can trap these loops of clusters of genes 
in a, in a cell mechanical uh, dependent manner that get activated and the precursor to this is this rewiring the chromosome map the 3D organization the chromosome map in a very precise manner that brings about this co-clustering of these genes. So, uh, what I told you today was how matrix constraints uh, that cells experience either in culture or in tissues provide a handle and an important handle to think about chromatin plasticity and changes in the matrix constraints really reorganize, rewire the chromosome assembly in a manner that there is mechanical codes for regulating genes. Uh, so, we think it has huge implications. Uh, uh, the reason we think about this in this <coughs> manner is that for us cells are modular devices and there are three important elements that we are actually looking at. One is the relative positions of the chromosomes and the relative intermingling of chromosomes is really optimized for the transcription network topology of a given cell type. And this optimization is actually stabilized by the cytoskeletal networks that couple to the nucleus. We now have a screen that has identified a number of molecular links between the matrix, between the matrix plasma membrane and the nuclear membrane and chromatin and people have actually identified a number of interesting linker proteins between the outer nuclear membrane and inner nuclear membrane that stabilize chromatin structure. So, when cells see extracellular cues whether it is soluble signals or mechanical signals or a combination of both, what they do is not only they activate transcription factors to feed on to specific uh, spatial neighborhoods in the nucleus, but also they remodel the cytoskeleton. And this remodeling of the cytoskin is, is the one that was missing in the, in the field and this remodeling is a very critical step because that remodeling of the cytoskeleton remodels the nuclear morphology. For example, I showed you a simple uh, context where if you take a very polarized cell and make the cell very isotropic, you remodel the cytoskeleton from a stress fiber form into more G actin form. And this remodeling is essential because this facilitates rearranging chromosomes in a modular manner within the nucleus. And that rearrangement of the chromosome then couples with this biochemical space that you can switch transcriptional programs in a very precise modular manner as I showed you. And where we are headed with this is we think we are quite excited with this because what you can now do is really define a phase space for cells uh, any given cell type uh, because what is critical for cells is geometry in tissue context. And for a given geometry of a cell you have optimized the nuclear organization and optimized transcriptional program in a terminally differentiated cell. Now, what I showed you is that by taking a terminally differentiated cell, I can tune this index and that is what happens in the tissue for a number of reasons when cells alter their shape, they alter their phenotype. Uh, in fact, we have been wondering why cells trans differentiate in the body and what you are getting is a good handle on how mechanical constraints are critical to trans differentiation steps. I showed you that going from this state to an isotropic state we have already converted a fibroblast mesenchymal cell into more like a stem cell like chromatin plasticity that I showed. And now we are looking at markers and they are turning on all kinds of interesting markers. So, reprogramming is, is, is critical and depend critically dependent on the cell matrix constraints. And now, because we can read out the plasticity of the nucleus and the way chromosomes rearrange and whole genomic uh, transcriptomes, we can now construct this coupling between these three important elements in terminally differentiated cells. And so, we think this offers an important inroad into biomarkers. Uh, we are setting up a startup um, thinking of single cell diagnostics from a nuclear biomarkers as uh, cues for diagnostics, single cell diagnostics because that gives us a handle on really we now have very precise measures 
of how nuclear architecture mechanics changes based on cell mechanical constraints, we think that if we can catch early any transition that happened, it provides a way of using it as a biomarker for early diagnostics. But more importantly, it helps us understand things about genomic integrity, because as all of you know, genome integrity through cell cycle is a critical step for maintenance of uh, 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 lineage specificity. And alterations in this mechanical constraints perhaps is the, is the way that you alter genomic integrity and transition to uh, cancer cell phenotypes. So, we have a large program now thinking about how mechanical constraints of cells intersect with genome integrity to transform them. Uh, and of course, it is uh, important to think about host pathogen interactions. What all of this is suggesting is that cellular mechanical state is a critical determinant of how signals are integrated into the, into the cells. Uh, because the mechanical tension pretty much controls how major signaling pathways get activated. So, we have a large program on looking at how TNF alpha and TJ beta pathways are modulated based on mechanical constraints. The short summary of that long story is that if you hold cells in different mechanical states, the integration of TNF alpha signaling is hugely altered, suggesting that now any host pathogen interaction must then be using this mechanical constraints as a precursor to invade, uh, invade host uh, pathogenesis. So, we have a growing program that is starting on thinking about how uh, particularly bacteria and today I was talking about viruses to some of your colleagues. In fact, my guess is that viral integration will be very critically depend on the mechanical tension uh, of cells. Mm. Host pathogen interaction then use some of the same design principles. So, basically if you understand this mechanical constraint that drives stability for cells we can actually now very precisely move in this epigenetic landscape. And what I showed you is a beginning ongoing large program using quantitative cell, cell, single cell biology as a way of uh, understanding combining microscopy with genomics uh, to get into this, uh, into this phase diagram that we are trying to construct. So, with that uh, let me end. Uh, there is a whole group of very talented colleagues that I have a number of talented colleagues who actually contributed to this work, a lot of funding from various sources, a lot of joint projects that I have that I did not talk about today. Uh, yeah. With that, thank you very much. <laughs>